The United States is the land of the almighty dollar, of markets, of financial capital, of macro companies such as Google and Amazon, of investors such as Warren Buffett, and of course, economic and contractual freedom. Undoubtedly, Uncle Sam has become the most vivid image of global capitalism. However, what if I told you that all that could be about to change? Take a look. A majority of millennials now reject capitalism, Harvard poll shows. Capitalism and market ideas seem to be losing more and more support among young Americans. According to a recent survey conducted by Harvard University, more than half of young people up to the age of 30 are against the capitalist system. In fact, this is something easy to intuit in social media networks. In recent time, spaces like X and Reddit have been flooded with memes, stories, and constant criticism of the prevailing economic model. Young people seem to feel disconnected from their jobs. They feel that they work in grey, empty offices with apathetic bosses, cold and distant colleagues, and all this in exchange for a mediocre salary that can condemn them to a depressive routine for life. And let's see, I know that all this may sound very pessimistic and even a bit whimsical, but besides young people, renowned academics such as David Graeber have even written entire books on how capitalism could have condemned us to a depressing and routine system. A system where we live worse than our parents and where we work like ants in exchange for crumbs. All this may have led to anti-capitalist politicians such as Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez gaining more and more prominence in the media. Ocasio Cortez blasts capitalism as an irredeemable system. The issue seems clear. Young people are living worse and worse, they feel depressed and without a clear future. A scenario that gives wings to anti-capitalist politicians. Simple enough, isn't it? But what if, in reality, the story is much more complex than that? What if what is behind this wave of anti-capitalism is something very different from what we have just told you? It's just that there are things that don't fit into that theory right off the bat. For example, over the past few years, real GDP per capita in the United States has been growing steadily. Today, on average, and correcting for price increases, the average American is paid 58% more than in 1990. The USA is getting richer and richer by leaps and bounds. Today's young people earn a lot more than their parents did 30 years ago. And let's see, it's not just about GDP anymore. Other factors such as unemployment, wages, and the healthcare system are also better than ever. Unemployment is at its lowest level in 54 years. New reports show record 35 million people enrolled in health coverage related to the Affordable Care Act. In short, it makes little sense to think that the rise of anti-capitalism is due to low wages or poor economic conditions in general. But what if the problem is not the wages, but the work environment? That is, being in an office all day long in front of a computer in a not particularly friendly environment with routine, boring tasks. Well, yeah, maybe that could explain the great loss of affection for capitalism among young people but let's be clear, would it be better to work in construction, in mines, or in the fields as past generations did? Would we really prefer those kinds of jobs? Well, here there are all kinds of opinions, but if we go to the data beyond complaints on the internet, what we see is that in reality, Americans are increasingly satisfied with their working conditions. Therefore, the conclusions seem clear. Anti-capitalism in the US is not a reflection of worse working conditions or a worse economic environment. It's the fruit of a much deeper and more complex phenomenon with many twists and turns. And that's why today on Visual Economic, we'll explain one of the main theories that could explain what's behind all this. Are you ready? Let's get started. Started. To understand the origin of growing anti-capitalism in the US, we must first travel back to the 1970s. The 70s were the origin of global rock with bands like Queen. It was the decade of presidents like Richard Nixon and Jimmy Carter, but above all, it was the final years of the Vietnam War. In any case, we're not here to talk about music or wars. We are here to talk about capitalism and the labor situation. And it turns out during the 70s, things were very different than they are today. Most of the workers had low skilled, low paid jobs. They were factory workers, waiters, bricklayers, plumbers. And in general, the exception was to have an office job like the current norm. In fact, going to college and being able to get a clerical job 
job in a bank or a law firm was considered a career success. So much so that in the 1970s, only one in 10 Americans had college degrees and could aspire to prominent jobs. Or to put it another way, going to college was a guarantee of success. It was a kind of insurance that allowed you to join the economic elite of the time. As a result, more and more people started going to college. In just three decades, the percentage of the population with university degrees shot up from 10% to almost 40%. Everyone wanted to become part of the economic elite of the day. The question is, what kind of university degrees were all these people pursuing? Well, it didn't really matter. Since there were so few people with higher education, getting your university degree made you special. It was basically a guarantee of a good job in any office, bank, or law firm in the country. Not only that, but during those years, the population was growing, the economy was growing, the government was spending more and more money, and teachers and public administrators needed to be hired in droves. And again, having a university degree also practically guaranteed being able to have a job in the public sector. Everything was going full steam ahead, or at least for a while because at the beginning of this century, everything started to change. And it was at precisely this time that the new anti-capitalist phenomenon began. Listen up. The two shocks of the 2000s. So far, we have talked about the 1970s and the employment situation back then. So now we have to talk about the great change that happened in the early 2000s. Of course, here we are talking about the huge financial crisis of 2008. Its consequences were dire. It was the big shock of the decade and probably the biggest shock in 80 years. Even so, during that same time period, there was another major change that was equally or more important technological change. Think about it. Between the years 2000 and 2010, we stopped sending each other letters or calling each other on the phone and switched to contacting each other by email or talking almost every day through chat software like WhatsApp. We also stopped taking pictures with dedicated cameras and printing the images and started taking photos with our cell phones and uploading the images to our social media pages. These changes were so enormous that we even started to flirt on apps like the legendary Tinder. In any case, technological changes have not only been limited to applications such such as cell phones in the workplace, many professions no longer offer as many job opportunities. With the rise of the booming technology sector and following the 2008 crisis, jobs related to the humanities, such as history, philosophy, and law, were completely ousted. The labor market began to demand engineers, physicists, and fewer professionals in the humanities. However, the problem was not only these sectors. Why? Do you remember who the elite were in the 1970s? Who could be considered lucky professionals at the time? That's right, bankers and clerks, people who had studied university and, thanks to getting a degree, gained access to companies comfortable, air-conditioned, and well-paid jobs. Well, it turns out that technological change has considerably reduced the working conditions for this type of role. With the rise of computers, digitization, online files, companies no longer need so many office staff to make photocopies or deal with paperwork. But let me give you one concrete example, bankers. 20 or 30 years ago, we all needed to go to the bank to do a number of tasks. Transfers, routine procedures, request loans. This is something that we can now do more quickly with our cell phones and without having to travel at all. The problem is that all those bankers and clerks who used to do that paperwork have now been replaced by technology and are no longer needed. The number of clerical employees and subordinates in banks has gone down drastically. In 2005, clerks and subordinates constituted more than 63% of banking employees in scheduled commercial banks. That number fell to nearly 30% in 2021. The bottom line is that since the 2000s, typical job offers for university graduates in the humanities or social sciences have greatly reduced. But at the same time, the number of college students skyrocketed. Today, almost half of the US population has managed to go to college four times more than in the 1970s. So what does all this mean? Well, it all comes back to supply and demand. Having a university degree is no longer something exceptional. It's very common to have one, and therefore, it's no longer a guarantee of success that makes you different or guarantees incredible job opportunities. University graduates are getting paid less and less relative to everyone else. And being a clerk, a job once considered a mark of success, has now become just another job, not particularly well paid or with great job prospects. Now, does this mean that the employment situation of young Americans is a disaster? Well, not necessarily. Although going to college may no longer make you the richest in your group of friends, it will 
certainly help you find a job and earn a decent salary. A salary that, given the country's economic growth, will continue to be much higher than that of the 70s, 80s or 90s. On top of that, working as a clerk will continue to be a much more comfortable job than being a bricklayer or working in a mine. The only difference with respect to the 70s is that in the 70s, those who went to university typically had a high probability of becoming part of the richest 10% of the population. And now, simply going to university gives you a regular job that does not stand out from the rest. So, is that a big enough problem to cause a huge wave of anti-capitalism? Could it explain the restlessness of so many young Americans? Or is there something else behind the whole thing? Well, pay attention. A matter of perspective? A few years ago, economists Miles Kimball and Robert Willis developed a new theory of happiness. According to them, happiness is not an absolute term, but depends almost entirely on expectations. For example, if tomorrow is your birthday, you will have the expectation that everyone will wish you well. But if no one does it, you'll feel bad. On the other hand, if no one wishes you well on a random day, you don't care. Happiness depends on what we expect. Well, beyond the possible causes of happiness, the phenomenon of college degrees may have played a key role in the career satisfaction of young Americans. Remember that in the 1970s, going to college was a symbol of success, a direct passport to a top economic position. Well, it's possible that the vast majority of young people have had that in their heads. Their expectation was that if they studied and applied themselves to a career, they would succeed professionally. However, the reality today is very different. So the expectation is broken and that can lead to strong discomfort, disappointment and dissatisfaction with the economic system. Yet, there could be an even more interesting factor in this whole situation. You see, apart from all this, an economist named Ada Carbonell studied how money affected happiness. In other words, does money really bring happiness? And generally, the answer is yes, although there are many nuances. For example, sometimes happiness doesn't depend on how much money a person earns, but rather on how much he or she earns in comparison to others. For envy, ego, or whatever reason, there are people who prefer to earn less money if it means that the rest of the people around them earn even less money. The most important thing to them is status, being the highest paid, and considering themselves better than others. The question is, what does all this have to do with university degrees? Well, again, in the 1970s, only 10% of the US population had a degree, and studying was a guarantee of being paid much more than the rest, but now, studying only guarantees that you'll be middle class. That is, there's a rupture of expectations, but also a rupture in the possibility of being much richer and much more successful than others. Something that, for better or worse, is a contributing factor to happiness. However, perhaps the most important aspect of this whole issue is how this phenomenon has been transferred to political power, to universities, and in short, the spheres of power. Think about it. What types of people could go to college up until the 1970s? The vast majority were the children of people with resources, power, and contacts. The university was almost exclusively for the children of the rich. For the wealthy social elite, sending their children to university was the way to consolidate them into the same elite circles to which their parents belonged. So what's the problem? Well, the moment university ceased to be a guarantee of success, suddenly many young people from well-off families, not necessarily ultra-rich, but well-off, saw how their job prospects were getting worse and worse as far as consolidating themselves in the elite went. And visual economic viewers, I can guarantee you that there is nothing more dangerous than young, well-off people with resources from their parents, angry at the system, and revolutionizing the universities against the system in their free time. Anti-capitalism on US university campuses. The culture war is fought dirty. Obviously, the reasons behind anti-capitalism are many, and in this video, we've explained one of the many theories. Specifically, the theory presented here is known as the overproduction of elites, in the sense of the excess of university students wanting to be part of the elite just because they've studied. In any case, now the questions are for you. What other factors or theories do you think could explain the growth in anti-capitalism? Do you think the situation will change soon? Is this all due to economic causes or is there a significant cultural factor? You can leave me your answer in the comments. And as always, don't forget that we release new videos every week, so subscribe to this channel and hit the little bell so you don't miss any of our updates. If you like this video, like it and see you in the next one. All the best and see you next time.